So now when I'm speaking their language about my creativity, I can be more convincing. I can be more specific. I can use language that's more rational. I can be more strategic in the way that I'm actually doing my job. And at that point, I'm not someone who's a vendor or I'm not someone who is a subordinate. I'm a strategic partner now. And at that point, you have a completely different conversation when you're all equals. You have a completely different conversation when you're seen as someone who's going to help them to accomplish the goals that they set out to achieve. Your agency group, your design firm is looked at completely differently whenever you're speaking to your clients. The whole dynamic changes if the creative person just understands how to do his or her job or approach his or her job as a creative from the standpoint or point of view of a strategist. The whole thing changes. Welcome to the Wow Factor Business Podcast with host Linda Knox. This is the podcast that's designed with a beginner in mind. Linda and her special guests help you as you travel along on your entrepreneurial journey by offering words of hope, words to enlighten, and words to inspire you to launch and persevere. And now, here's your host, Linda Knox. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Wow Factor Business Podcast with me, your host, Linda Knox. This is the podcast that is designed with a beginner in mind. And if you're just getting started on your entrepreneurial journey or whatever your special calling is in life, then this is the place to be. Well, are you a creative who's so busy creating that you haven't had the time to explore or learn the business side of how to build and maintain your empire? Well, you'll want to listen because our next special guest expert has a lot to say about this. Brooklyn-based Douglas Davis enjoys being one of, of the variety of voices needed in front of and behind the concept, marketing plan, or digital strategy. His approach to creativity combines right brain creative problem solving and left brain strategic thinking. The unique mix of, of creative strategy, integrated marketing, and art direction is what Douglas brings into the classroom. Douglas began his teaching career as an adjunct in Tanum with his professional career, following in the footsteps of his mentors at Pratt University, who worked during the day and taught at night. Douglas is a former adjunct professor at the New York University in the Master's in Integrated Marketing Program and current adjunct associate professor in City College in the Branding and Integrated Communications Program. As a How Design University contributor, his ideas have been presented in webinar, conference, and course format. In 2011, Douglas founded the Davis Group LLC and continues to offer strategic solutions to client branding, digital, and design problems. Douglas holds a BA in graphic design from Hampton University, an MS in communications design from Pratt Institute, and an MS in integrated marketing from New York University. Douglas, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda, for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Now, Douglas, I did hear you on another podcast, and what you said really was exciting to me, and I just had to have you on the program. I I purchased your book, and we're going to be talking about your book later on, and I couldn't put it down. I'm not quite finished with it yet, but it was really interesting, and I think our listeners are going to get a lot of value. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the support. Okay, now the first um, question here I have is is somewhat twofold. The first part here, I'm going to ask you, who or what is a creative? And secondly, what is a creative strategist? So if I could define creatives, plural, really broadly, I'd say that creatives are the people who determine what our world looks like. So if you think about all the things that are designed If you think about everything that comes in your mailbox, or if you think about every time you go to the grocery store and you look at all the packaging, or if you look at everything that's in a library or a bookstore, um, from cradle to grave, designers have to craft what those things look like. And so I include everyone who's involved in that process of making these design decisions. So if you're a graphic designer, If you are someone who happens to work in advertising with uh, a writing partner and you're coming up with concepts that are on during the Super Bowl in the form of commercials or 
digital ads that happen while you're going from website to website, um, or if you're someone who happens to be involved in book design, uh, or someone who is involving who who is designing the user experience that we all are basically using whenever we're on our digital devices. I include you in that creatives plural uh, word. And so that's that's who creatives are. That's all of us if you're making things. And, and that's not just as, as an artist. I want to be really clear that uh, what I'm not saying is that if you're creating something that's visual and it doesn't have a client problem or there is no target audience, someone who you're trying to reach with a message or format and you you're just creating something for a personal expression that's an artist that's different but if you if you have a client if you have a brand that you're communicating on behalf of to a particular target group and you're tasked with creating that relationship you're included in this creatives uh, plural thing so the second part of the question is uh, what is a creative strategist and that goes a bit further and it speaks to uh, as I was saying, the brand itself that you're communicating on behalf of, so as designers or as someone who's creating packaging or editorial design, we have to keep in mind that we are uh, emissaries in, uh, in some ways. We, we're we the people who need to c- communicate uh, not our own messages, but we're communicating on behalf of the brands that trust us to bring their uh, products and services to market. I always say that creative people, designers, are uh, we provide the spoonful of sugar that make business and marketing objectives palatable to the public. And so a creative strategist is someone who would understand not only the brand that we're speaking on behalf of and the, the ways that that brand communicates in tone, in words, in pictures, but also someone who understands the target group that we're tasked with communicating that message to. So the group of people who... Uh, let's say Nike wants to communicate that they have a new shoe and that shoe is not just for runners, but maybe it's for runners who have been running for quite a while and who are maybe at their middle age point, but they're still very active. So as a result, they have a very special soul in the shoe or it's made out of materials that would cater to someone who might be in it in, in that stage of life. We not only as creative strategists and as designers and creative people, we have to not only understand how Nike communicates so that we don't miscommunicate uh, visually or with the tone that we're speaking in on behalf of Nike, but we also have to understand the life stage of the audience that we're trying to speak to. So a creative strategist is going to take all of that into consideration and therefore choose the right channels or choose the right tone or choose the right words or the pictures. So you're part business person and part designer. Wow. Now, your bio is so impressive. And as I read this, and especially the educational part of it, let's let's go back a bit. When did you first get the creative the creative bug at an early age, or did you when did you decide that you had that creative uh, air about you, or maybe later on in adult life? When did you first discover that you were a creative or a designer or in that field? Good question. So my mom would my mom might answer this and say, "Well, when I had." This one son who was lighting fireworks in the house, or uh, when I had this one son who fell out of a moving car, uh, or when I had this one son who had, you know, sniffed pepper, all these different crazy things, which is <laughs> me. Uh, maybe she knew that I was not the normal kid. And uh, we all have these stories of when we were young. But I could tell probably that maybe my mom would would say that I could tell that he was a bit different um, from the beginning. But I think when I recognized it was when my older cousins took me to the fair. I'm from South Carolina originally. In Lexington, South Carolina, we would just drive maybe 15, 20 minutes to Columbia, South Carolina, which is the capital there. And they have the state fair every year. And we were so excited to go. So my, my cousins, my older cousins, would take me there. And do you remember those uh, those things there where you, you'd have to throw the darts at the balloons? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So so we go there. I throw some darts at the balloon, and I won this Garfield mirror. 
So just a plain mirror had Garfield on it. So I go home that night. I sit on the floor. My mom's cooking in the kitchen. And I draw the mirror. And then I show my mom. So I draw Garfield. And she asked me, did you trace that? And I said, no. And from there, she recognized that I had a gift. And so there was those uh, art in you, do you remember those, uh, I guess it was like art instruction schools and it would happen through the mail and oh, you yeah. have to draw the pirate or the turtle. <laughs> or the okay. dog, yeah. So I don't, yeah, exactly. So I don't know where she found the money, but um, she figured out how to scrape the money together to get me those art instruction schools that were those through the mail art classes. So I would draw every day and I wanted to be a cartoonist. So I wrote Jim Davis and he wrote me back and it was amazing. And from there, I think I just immersed myself into art. And I was really grateful that our really small town had a wonderful art program, K through 12. The whole time uh, I was in art classes and I was painting, rock carving, sculpting. Um, We were working with ceramics. We were basically uh, doing pretty much everything in art. And again, very small town, but a very robust art program. And that helped me to focus a lot of my energy. And so my behavior changed uh, as, I, as I started out saying. I was very mischievous as a kid. And it really completely turned around my behavior and my focus because I had creative outlets in these areas. So I think I'd say that that's probably when I learned that I was a creative person. Yeah. I'm glad that you bring that up too, because different children are different. And I I believe strongly that parents should be looking at their kids, grandparents should be looking at their grandchildren to see what is it that may be their special talent or gift. I think we could tell, you know, whether they have a mind for math or science or computers or for art and to to hone that craft. So your mother is a very wise woman, (laughs) very wise woman. I appreciate that. And I'll say one more thing about this, because I think you're absolutely absolutely right to, to, to call this out. Um, I, I am so fortunate that my mom never once allowed anyone to say to me, you're, you're going to be broke. You can't be, you can't be an artist. You're, you're not, you, you need to be a doctor or you need to be a dentist. And obviously we know what these things are. But again, as I started out saying in the very beginning, when we were talking about what, a, you know, who's create, who is included in the creatives title, if you really think about this, again, everything in the hospital had to be designed as well, from signage, the actual architecture, the blueprints of the building that you're in, the industrial design for the beds, all of the labels for the actual medicine and the packaging so that people know what they're giving you, the forms that the nurses are writing on. So I'm literally calling out that from the, from the cradle, from the experience that we were, when we were born, to the experience when we die, all of those things happen to include design. But if your parents are not privy to that information, my parents weren't, my mom wasn't. Um, She didn't know that graphic design was a, a, a viable profession. She just knew that my son is lighting fireworks in the house and I can't control him because he's all over the place. And for some reason he draws Garfield one night and everything changes in terms of his behavior. So whatever that is, we're going to keep encouraging it. And I'm so grateful that she didn't fear my being taken care of as an adult so much that that fear didn't uh, limit my imagination and what I wanted to do as a little kid who knew nothing. She never said, oh, you shouldn't be that. Or she never once allowed anyone to tell me that I shouldn't be an artist. And though I didn't become a cartoonist, I'm so grateful that my mom, as you said, Linda, paid attention to me and paid attention to what was going on. So I would say to any listeners out there that, you know, sometimes your parents in, in an abundance of love may decide to, to say, to make suggestions or even impose on you what they would have done. But you do have to listen to yourself. And I would say to any parents listening, if, if, you're, if your children have this gift, this inclination, pay attention to them and then encourage that. It may not turn into 
a cartoonist. I didn't become a cartoonist. I became a graphic designer who now is a creative strategist, who is also an author, who is also a professor at New York City College of Technology at CUNY. But my point is that if none of that would have happened if my mom didn't protect me and allow me to do what uh, the gift was that was already inside of me. So I'm glad we spent some time to talk about that. So important. Now, you got your undergrad at Hampton. Is it Hampton University? Hampton University. I'm a proud pirate. Yeah, beautiful uh, campus and a nice HBCU. My my niece graduated from there. Um, shout out to Cicada. <laughs> she graduated oh, from awesome there. Oh, Cicada. <laughs> and, Home uh, by the sea, that's right. <laughs> it's a beautiful camp- campus. Now, how important was it? I mean, it, when you think about your education and, and of course, and you went on to graduate school, but how important is it to find the right type of place to um, get your uh, educational foundation in your, in your field, especially in the field of, of design? And how were you um, inspired? Did you pick Hampton because of that or, or how did that play in your? Good question. So I'll pick up where I left off. So my story is the story of the professor who had no plans to go to college, Linda. <laughs> and I'll say that because I didn't know about Hampton. A, a gentleman in high school wore a Hampton University sweatshirt, and that was literally the extent that I'd known uh, about Hampton. So 11th grade summer, I say to myself, on my own, just I'm thinking, and I say to myself, you know, if I don't go to college, I want to say that I didn't go to college because I chose not to go to college, not because I couldn't go to college. So this is what I did. I started taking the SAT. I took it three times to get the best possible score that I could get. On my own, by the way. Uh I decided to go to summer school on my own, and I started to take the math that I needed. I took the uh, foreign language that I needed. And I want to point out that, again, as a kid in South Carolina with an amazing art uh, foundation, and my, my behavior became different. My grades became different only in the art part of things because I was bored in the other areas that I did not have one conversation with a guidance counselor about college, wow. not one Linda. So I'm grateful for uh, being brought up down South where there's a whole secondary education happening at the same time as your formal education in school. You're learning about uh, your your own culture. You're learning about the people who you come from. And every time we would go somewhere in the summers, we would always take a detour to the black college that was local or see something concerning MLK, whatever was in the area when we would go to Florida to Daytona Beach or when we would go to Atlanta or Virginia Beach. So we never went to Hampton on any of those tours, but I say all that to say that if it wasn't for my aunt and my cousin going to South Carolina State, I, those were the conversations that I had about college. They were all within my family. No, None of my family had gone to Hampton. So again, all of this thinking was on my own, and I just wanted to have the options. So I decided to do all that stuff during summer school. I had already graduated high school, so I'm volunteering at the Urban League in Columbia, South Carolina, and I stumble onto a conversation in the next room where the gentleman who I did know who was involved with the Urban League, I did not know he was a Hampton University alumni and that he was the vice president of recruitment admissions for the Southeast chapter. Wow. So I stumble onto a conversation. I, w- I wasn't even in the original conversation. I walk into the room that he's speaking to some other people who are in the program uh, about Hampton. And he says, hey, if you have the college requirements, you should apply. So I happen to have the college requirements. So I applied. I happened to get in. And then I say to my mom, I'm going to Virginia. That's how I chose Hampton University. Now, one other thing about this story. So I, I originally think that I'm going to Hampton University to major in fashion merchandising. My mom packs all my stuff into the car. So I get into the car. My mom drives me six hours uh, up to Hampton University's campus, helps me unpack, walks around campus one time to see what she's paying for, and then she waves at me on the way out. She would come back four years later for my graduation. So I get there, and I go to registration, and I'm thinking I'm going to uh, enroll in the fashion merchandising program. And they had phased it out, but I did not know that. 
So at that point, I say to myself, oh, well, I'll just be a graphic design major because I, you know, fashion is only one of the other symptoms of art. It's just another outlet. So I'll just do graphic design because I never did that before. And so I was more than prepared to go to school. And it was literally random that I chose graphic design because the other fashion merchandising path was not offered anymore. And it was literally random that I had decided to go to Hampton because that was literally my only school option. And it was literally random that I even prepared to have my college requirements. Wow. And so it's, you know, I say all this to say that I, I personally believe in God and I personally believe that there's no way that all those things would have just fallen into place. So it was meant and I, I guess I could say Hampton chose me. Yeah, I was just getting ready to say that as I'm listening to your story here that I, I'm also believing, I just believe that all things work together for the good. So when I, I from the time that you heard the gentleman talking about Hampton to the design program, I mean, the fashion program being phased out, I mean, there's there's no mistake there. I mean, your purpose was, was uh, God was working hand in hand with you. I believe <laughs> you it. Get to I your believe purpose. it as well. And, now, of I course, you've gone well. on to other schools, and we're going to talk about that a, a, a little bit later. But I'm going to read a couple of things that I've heard you, I've read about and heard you on some other shows say. Now, you've said that that um, business schools don't teach how to inspire designers and that design schools uh, students are not taught business. Um, can you explain that? Absolutely. So um, what I learned at Hampton was that uh, work ethic. Uh, obviously, I learned that from cutting grass in the South and my grandparents who didn't finish the you know, 12th grade. They, they dropped out at like fifth grade. They were sharecroppers. They taught me if you're going to do something, do it well and do it right the first time. So I had a bit of home training and a lot of people teaching me principles of doing things right. So when I went to Hampton, a lot of my professors there were they had gone to Yale. So they were taught by Joseph Albers, this great artist from uh, back in the Bauhaus era. And they taught me if you, if they want five, then you do 35 and you choose the best five. So I learned a level of work ethic that combined with what I learned in high school concerning just as a creative person having an outlet in those different ways. So with business school not teaching how to inspire designers, and design school is not teaching business. After I left Hampton, I went to Pratt Institute and I got my master's there. So after a year there at Pratt, uh, I didn't apply for my first job and I was found and hired. Um, and then I continued to go to school uh, at night and work in the day. I learned that most of the time while I was in design school, I had no idea of why we were in the room as designers. So again, I'll go back to what I was talking about in the very beginning, that, that our experience in the world is designed from the cradle to the grave, every aspect of it. And there are more people, there, there are more design decisions than there are visually literate people to make them. That's why you see these mistakes happening where the best picture says La La Land, but it was wrong because it's really moonlight. That's because there's a design problem on these cards that needed a visually literate person to make that card, but it happened to be that there are more design decisions than there are visually literate people. So someone who did not have the training made that mistake. Or uh, when Steve Harvey crowns the wrong woman, uh, you know, Miss America, it's because of those things or, you know, the, the butterfly ballots and things like that. So when I was in design school, I realized that they didn't teach me why I was in the room. They were more focused on aesthetics and making things pretty. And, and, and that's part of things. So when I got out and I got my first job, I was able to get positions of responsibility relatively quickly. I broke into advertising, and as the youngest person in the room, I was able to convince not only the CEO as well as the creative director that we, the three months that I was there freelancing, I saw us lose and leave a lot of money on the table in X amount of ways. So I was then at that point... Uh, made the head of the digital arm inside of this small agency. This was at J. Walter Thompson. It was a little small specialized agency within J. Walter Thompson called Briard. Uh, they're not there anymore. But uh, I became the head of the digital arm there. And 
I realized that I started losing battles because of the fact that I was ignorant of the larger business or marketing considerations that informed aesthetics. So I say all these things to say that I could, you know, I'm in the room, I'm doing well, and I'm going as far as my creative education has taken me. And at the same time, when it came down to justifying those creative decisions in the context of the business and the marketing objectives that we were tasked to solve on behalf of the client, I had no frame of reference of what those things even were because design school doesn't teach business. The other side, business school doesn't teach how to inspire designers. So after losing those battles, I realized after stumbling into a strategy session one day that, oh yeah, this is that thing that beat me. Linda, I didn't even know what that thing was, but I recognized it. So I decided to apply, and this is after seven or eight years of having uh, a very robust freelance career. I did not have to choose to go back to school, but I ended up applying to NYU in, in a master's program in integrated marketing so that I could learn the strategy behind the execution so that I could add that to the creative side that I had already uh, developed from Hampton and from Pratt. So while I was there, I realized that I had a unique point of view because I was the design person in a business school. And, you know, I'll be honest, I remember being in that class, maybe the first 30 minutes of the first semester in statistics, and I wanted somebody to shoot me in the face, Linda. I wanted to be <laughs> over because I everything in me screamed that, like, what did I just do? Because I had to learn a completely different language that was spoken on the total different side of the brain than what I was used to using on the creative side. So while I was there, I realized that I had a very unique point of view because I was the art person in business school and everyone else was on the business side. And they're tasked with building creative teams or working with designers or helping designers to understand what the client wants. And they're usually in a managerial role because of the fact that creative people aren't taught business. And at the same time, when I went through that business curriculum, I realized that they we're not taught how to talk to designers. So sometimes you'll be in an agency or, or start a job with, with your business counterparts. And since they weren't taught how to talk to designers or get the most out of them or inspire us, you get a brief that's the size of a novel during the kickoff of a project. And as a creative person, you're already having trouble focusing. So now you have to sift through all this unneeded information because the business person wasn't taught that they needed to actually inspire you with that first initial brief that would set the goals of the campaign and explain who we're talking to, and that that brief needed to be charged with emotion, with words that would inspire a thousand pictures. You, we've all heard the saying that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, but in this context, business people need to learn how to write creative briefs in a way that one word could inspire a thousand pictures because their audience is the creative people. And so when that didn't happen, and when you realize that, oh, they weren't taught how to inspire designers. So you get this novel of information that you have to sift through. And now it saps your energy because you're having to read through this useless thing that's supposed to make your job easier, but it makes your job harder. And therefore you disregard it. And then you start to just do things that are just making things pretty because you fall back on your, your creative vocabulary and your creative training. So that's where the tension comes from. The creative person is arguing and touchy on the basis of this is my creation and this is what's right. The business person is arguing on the basis of the business objectives, the marketing objectives, and the, the target audience, but they bury it in all that information that was useless and that does not help you to be inspired to do your job. And so now everybody's arguing in the room and the client expects everyone involved with your brand to be strategic. And when we lose the account because they fire us, because we weren't taught to talk to each other on the same team to service the client, it doesn't really matter whose fault it is. So I say all that to say that that's why I wrote the book, Creative Strategy in the Business of Design, because after going to design school, I realized you don't teach your business. After going to business school, I realized they don't teach business students how to inspire designers. And so I realized that there was this whole education that has to happen after you graduate 
that would be so much easier for you if you had it while you were in school. And I couldn't find it anywhere. And so I had to write it. Yeah. Now, that's a great segue into your book. I do want to talk about your book. Your book is entitled Creative Strategy and the Business of Design. And and if you don't mind, I took, like I said, I've, I've got the book. I'm not completely finished with it, but I'm halfway done with it. And Thank it's you. I can't put it down. It's really good. But I wanted to read just a little splurb here that was on page yes, 19. And, and here we go. This is the quote. At some point during, during my career, I realized that I lost creative battles because I was ignorant of the larger business of marketing considerations that inform aesthetics. I could write the design proposal, build the team, design or direct the executives, and pitch the idea. Yet I can remember times when none of this served me. Why? I didn't have the whole picture. So I had taken my notes, uh, and that's the end of the, the quote there, I had taken my notes and I was going to ask you about those battles, and you kind of touched on it on it earlier, but in losing those creative battles, that I guess speaks of what you were just saying a minute ago. When you get in these rooms, you have your idea and, de- and designers have their ideas, but then the business right. people have their ideas. And so talk a little bit more about the, the battles that would ensue there and, and why you felt like you were Absolutely. losing the battles. So, it, you know, when, when, you cook, when you put everything you have into your creation, as most creatives do, and especially your audience, if you're speaking to beginners uh, or people who have, you know, just started on the journey of, you know, utilizing their creativity to get into a career, um, you know, you're really sensitive. You're very touchy about your, what you're doing because it, it's an outlet. We, we put everything into what we do. And it's, it's an extension of us. And so when you get into a room and someone cuts it down, you know, you have to learn how to build a, a thick skin and to be less emotional about it. But that's, that's very difficult because you're using the very emotions that allow you to create. That's the reason why you're a creative person. You're emotional. So you get into a room with people who are rational. <laughs> They're thinking strategic. It's a different side of the brain. And so when that clashes, it's not pretty. And, and if you think about it, that tension is there, and you're actually on the same team. That also becomes very difficult because, you know, at the end of the day, you need to have one agency recommendation or at least, you know, two of them or three maybe. And we all have to be on the same page as to what is the best thing for the client if we're going to lead the client, that is. Um, there's some agency client relationships where the client says jump and then the agency says how high or the design firm says how high. Those will not last um, because it's it's kind of the equivalent of a baby telling you that they, and again, I'm not saying that clients are babies, but I'm saying that, you know, oftentimes as parents or as adults, you know better than to give the baby the whole tub of ice cream to eat, or you know better than to let the baby stick their finger in the socket or play in the street. Now, this baby doesn't understand why you're saying no. You're just saying no to them and they're mad at you and they cry but you know better than that and you can lead them even though they might not understand. So in in that analogy, creative people obviously are there to help the client to make the best decision. So when the client who's not trained in the creative part of what we do is sort of dictating what they need versus leaving that to a creative strategist or leaving that to an agency full of professionals who do that, it would be the equivalent of you as the open heart surgery patient instructing the doctor how to do your open heart surgery. It doesn't make sense. So I think when you're in those situations and you're on a team and that team is, you know, the very uh, credentials that allowed the creative part of the team and the business part of the team to even be professionals on the same team servicing a client, if those credentials didn't teach you how to talk to each other, it's very, very touchy. So I remember being in situations where I would propose something and I knew that it was right, but I couldn't speak the language that would convince the the new business leader or it, that would convince the CEO or that would convince the client sometimes because I was speaking in terms of the emotional part of design, typefaces, colors, the details, the world that they don't live and breathe. They live and breathe marketing objectives and metrics and target audiences and business strategies, which you weren't taught. So that always is going to 
introduce a clash because if you're not speaking the same language, you're basically on different planet, and that's never pretty. Do you think though that because I can I can understand certainly that side of it, but as um, create creatives and and I don't know, and even in your book, do you teach the importance even for the creatives to understand and have a handle on marketing uh, metrics, um, target audience? Do you get involved with that at all, or h- how important is it for a creative to have a handle on that when they're getting ready to sit down and talk with one of their clients? It is. So easy. The very first chapter is called Welcome to the Other Side of the Brain. Business concepts creatives should understand. I get into that from the very beginning because what it took me a whole career to understand is that the reason that we're in the room is to achieve a business or a marketing objective. That's the reason why a graphic designer is in the room. That's the reason why an art director or a copywriter or a creative strategist is in the room. So if we don't understand the language, and I always give this analogy, let's say you and I, Linda, had to articulate to uh, a group of people who were in a burning building that the building was burning and that we needed to get them out. Now, this is a very urgent message. This is a message that is time sensitive. And the only caveat is that there are people who speak French, people who speak Spanish, And some of them are elderly, and some of them are children, and some of them are middle-aged. And those middle-aged people are are Americans. So if you and I, who have responsibility to evacuate this building, we have only one message. The building's on fire. Get out now. The problem is that we have age to consider, young and elderly, and we have French and Spanish to consider, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to communicate this language, this the same message three different ways because when we say, Hey guys, the building's on fire, get out. That takes care of the middle aged people who speak English. They're all going to leave. But the young little girls and boys who speak Spanish who are like three and four years old, we didn't say it in their language and we might need to actually use a different tone of voice. We might need to get down on their level so we can see them eye level. We might need to articulate it in different language like different words, but we, whatever we chose to say would have to be in Spanish. And then we could get them out, but then the elderly would still be in the building and we'd have to speak in French and we'd have to communicate very respectfully, but we would have to communicate time sensitive. So my point in all of that is that if you don't understand your audience and if you can't articulate what they need to understand in the way that they need it to be understood, if that makes any sense, Mm -hmm. um, then we're going to miss. So as a designer, that's our job. We are are tasked with articulating whatever the business wants us to say or whatever the brand wants us to say, but we have to understand the target. So it's so important that we understand the business objectives because that's why we're in the room. One other thing about that, if we can incorporate business process strategy into our creative process, it's easier to defend. So back when I was in the agency and I was losing battles, if I had just understood the objectives and business and marketing and strategy before, I could have then incorporated the things that are keeping the CEO, the CMO, and all the business and marketing brand managers up at night. I could incorporate their, the ways that they're going to be judged on their job into my creative solutions so that up front, I've already thought through how their boss is going to judge them on their annual review because I've looked at what their what success and failure is in their definition. So I've already looked at that. I've chose the right typefaces according to that, or I've looked at what they're tasked with accomplishing, and I've built my creative process with that inside of it. So now when I'm speaking their language about my creativity, I can be more convincing. I can be more specific. I can use language that's more rational. I can be more strategic in the way that I'm actually doing my job. And at that point, I'm not someone who's a vendor or I'm not someone who is a subordinate. I'm a strategic partner now. And at that point, you have a completely different conversation when you're all equals. You have a completely different conversation when you're seen as someone who's going to help them to accomplish the goals that they set out to achieve. 
your agency group, your design firm is looked at completely differently whenever you're speaking to your clients. The whole dynamic changes if the creative person just understands how to do his or her job or approach his or her job as a creative from the standpoint or point of view of a strategist. The whole thing changes. Wow. You know, I, I'm listen, listening to you talk and I'm taking notes. And I always take notes when I'm talking to somebody. And I'm also looking at the outline of your book. It comes in four parts and it is just loaded. We could actually do a whole podcast and just have you go through the book by itself. And I oh, and the could. information is is so valuable. I was looking at it and I thought to myself, I said, you know, it probably should be a prerequisite for some college courses. And I noticed here that you do teach uh, as a professor at the is it the City College Branding and Integrated Communications Graduate Program? There, that's one place that I teach. Uh, my full-time uh, teaching job is at, and that, that's within CUNY. My full-time teaching job is I'm an associate professor uh, at the New York City College of Technology in the Communication Design Department. But I also teach at City College, their branding and integrated communications. They call it BIC, the BIC program. That's the master's program. Uh, I've taught at uh, NYU, so uh, I mentioned NYU earlier. Um, I was very fortunate and very humbled to be invited to be a part of their faculty while I still had my cap and gown on on graduation wow. day. That was really amazing. I did that for two years before I uh, went on to write Creative Strategy in the Business of Design as a book. Um, and I've taught at my other alma mater, Pratt Institute, the only place that I haven't taught is at Hampton University and you know, fingers crossed. Yeah, it gotta one get day you in there. I would be able to <laughs> gotta get yeah, you I would in love there. to. Now your book, do you teach from your book? Or do, uh, it should really be uh, you should I'm putting in a little hint here. Some of the material <laughs> or, or the you. material just it just seems like it'd be perfect for um for college teaching. Thank you. So it I've uh I've personally not required any of my students or classes to buy my book. Um, however, I know that in the University of Oregon, uh, Deborah Morrison's Brand Strategy Seminar uses my book um, out there. Go Ducks! Uh, mm-hmm. I know that uh, <laughs> I know that certain places at Pratt Institute, uh, some of my colleagues uh, use my book. I know that down in Atlanta, um, Nikita uh, Pope, she went to Hampton with me. Uh, at Graphic Design. She teaches at the Creative Circus. Uh, She's used my book before. So there are people around the country using the book, and uh, I've been able to, through social media, connect with people internationally who are also using the book, and so I've been really humbled by it. I hope that at some point uh, I will be able to write a course on creative strategy for uh, the places that I teach at as well. I just have been trying to make sure that it was relevant and that out in the field that professionals would take note. And so I've been more focused on taking the message to students uh, through social media versus through my classes. But everything that I teach in my classes, graduate and undergraduate, I've written in the book and then some. Now, the um, how, H-O-W, Design University, is that something like lynda.com or what? what is that? And explain, now you're a contributor there. Explain that program. So how is, uh, if you know the publishers of How Magazine, they are the publishers of Print Magazine. So these are design staples. Everyone who goes through design education, uh, one of their exercises is to redesign print magazine's cover. How Magazine came about in, I think, 1985, and it was more focused on the practice of design. Uh, Print Magazine is more focused on, I think, theory and and the academic side of things. So how, um, and this is the story of how the book even came about. They approached me, I think in 2012, because of my resume and the things that I was doing, they saw on LinkedIn and they approached me to write a course on uh, How Design University, which is similar to Linda. The difference is that 
with how uh, there are people like myself, who you may or may not have heard within the design community at conferences or in books and articles. And so they get people like myself to actually write courses. So I think that they're utilizing uh, some of the exposure of the author in this particular case of the course in order to leverage the knowledge of the course. And that's the difference between Linda. So I think at, at that point, they, they reached out to me and they wanted me to write a course and it was called Creative Strategy in the Business of Design. It was actually only four lessons. Uh, so it was over a month and you could take one lesson per week and do it at your leisure. And it was about $250 to join. It was like a workshop and they offered it nine times at that point and they had made $17,000. And I was wow. like, oh my gosh, <laughs> really? Are you serious? Like I'm not the only person going through this stuff? And so at that point, they invited me to speak at How Design Live, which is a huge conference uh, for creative people and designers uh, in Boston. And my session was 8.30 in the morning on a Friday. And the previous night at 11 o'clock on Thursday, they had a party. So I was thinking, nobody's going to (laughs) come. And Linda, at 8.30 in the morning, there were 697 people there. Wow. And I couldn't believe it. And so because that went well, uh, I did a webinar and they said that they had the most people engaged and not drop off from the beginning to the end that they had ever had. And then I wrote another article in uh, How Magazine and that went well. And so I thought to myself, you know, I, I think I'm not the only person going through this. And so maybe I'll pitch a book. And so I pitched the book to speak about these issues in a larger format since I had had that much response to everything I had been talking about, these business creative issues. And lo and behold, they accepted the proposal and I freaked out because I'd never written a book before. Like I'm not a writer. And so I just took on that and and thank God, you know, that it was launched uh, in June, 2016, last year. Wow. So, Really you talk fortunate. about all things working together. That That's so impressive. Now, I'm going to have you give your uh, contact information at the end. Before we do, I have a, a, just a few more questions for you. I sure, went on no uh, your, your website, www.douglasdavis.com, and I noticed some of your, I think they promote your promotional videos. Uh, you did a promotional video on yeah. chapter 14 and 13. 14 is the drag dragon slaying and chapter 13, how to take a punch in the face. And this is probably just an aside, but who produced that and how did you get that together? That's really nicely done, those videos. Thank you. So huge shout out to one of my former students who's now uh, a freelance uh, video editing professional for um, title actually, uh, that music uh, streaming service. Um, but he came through my classroom and I saw he was very talented. So I hired him. His name is Clifford Harry. Um, and uh, he's really amazing. I think his website is shot by Clifford Harry. So you guys should check that out, shot by cliffordharry.com. But my idea when I came to Clifford, I was thinking to myself, you know, Everyone says, hey, buy my book, buy my book, but books have so many other chapters. And so you're really glossing over the reasons why you should buy your book and who should buy your book. There's so much more information that you should actually be articulating. But when you just say buy my book, you don't really get into any of the details of any of that. So people who would actually benefit from your book probably don't get that message. So I thought to myself, and this was the time when I had decided, hey, you know, I want to lose some weight. I want to look better in my clothes because I'm gaining all this weight and I want to make sure that I can do something different. So I decided to go to a boxing class with one of my students and I almost die. And I realized, you know, maybe I could make a video because chapter 13 of my book is how to take a punch in the face. And it's seven tips on how to successfully remain in the creative field. I wrote it with a veteran ad man, and just I was I was actually on his uh, board at the Four A's, Ron Berger. Uh, he was involved with Jaguar as an account, Volvo, 
Uh, and also, if you'll remember the Dunkin' Donuts commercial, time to make the donuts. He oh, wrote yeah. all that stuff. Really? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was really made. Because, you know, I'm a young guy, and so I, I realize that, you know, I have something to say. I have a point of view, but I don't have the perspective that this person has. So I invited him. Uh, and he graciously agreed to help me write that chapter because he's seen it all and was able to contribute a lot of things about how to successfully, you know, stay involved in, in the uh, field. But he's from Brooklyn. I live in Brooklyn now. I've been there for 19, 20 years. So I realized that that chapter should be named appropriately where two Brooklyn guys talk about how to take a punch in the face. Um, and so since I was boxing, I realized that, you know, maybe I should just do a video trailer that promoted a chapter instead of the book, because the chapter's in the book. So if we promote the chapter, we're actually promoting the book. But if we promote the chapter, we can get more specific. Um, and this latest version is called Slay. And uh, it's, as you mentioned, about chapter 14 uh, of the book, and that is Dragon Slaying. And it's it's a visual essay about successfully managing fear, which is what the chapter is about. Uh, I, I believe everybody faces fear and doubt or excuses, but a creative person specifically has to fight them in order to unleash the creativity inside. And I, I look at fear as a dragon that won't shut up. And the only way we can, as creative people, slay that dragon is to silence it, which uh, is what the visual essay illustrates is the struggle to push past the fear that hinders creativity. So yeah, you can see it at thinkhowtheythink.com. Yeah, that was very nicely done. And I, I will definitely have a, a link into the show notes. And then that, that will, uh, what you were just saying as far as fear and things like that are concerned is, a, is another part where I'm going to segue in here to give some final words. As you know, this is the podcast designed with a big beginner in mind. And I also have an acronym, H-E-L-P. I like to try to give words of hope, words to enlighten, words to get people to launch and to persevere. And in, in closing here, if you could just give a few words of encouragement. Now you talked about the fear part and the doubt and never giving up, but to our listeners, if some of, if somebody feels like, you know, they're a starving artist or they just want to throw in the tie, I know right. that you gave a, a talk before you gave a testimony, uh, I, I guess, um, where you were somewhat successful and then the great recession hit and you had to, I think you said you worked at Gap and you had to freelance, but yeah, you did absolutely. get land back uh, on your feet. But in closing, uh, give a few parting words of encouragement to, um, to someone who's listening and they're just thinking, you know, this whole thing is just not working out the way I think it's working out, just to kind of tell them to hang in there and, and to not give up. Absolutely. So what I always tell designers and young people is that if you sacrifice in, in ways that most people don't sacrifice, you get to enjoy benefits most people don't get to enjoy. So when people are going to the Star Wars premiere where they're going to the Black Panther premiere, you should be working, work, push. And you don't have to ever try to be perfect because what is perfection is subjective. Do your best. Practice makes presentable. So if you can just keep practicing, there'll be a time when you can, you know, enjoy those benefits. But right now you have to invest in your future and there's no shortcut to that. So I always tell people to fail, fail hard, fail often, because that was the only way that I was able to make it in graduate school at 21. Fail, fail hard, fail often. That's the only way I was able to make it into the profession at 22 without even applying for my first job. Fail, fail hard, fail often, because it's the only way that I was able to, at 23, once I lost my job because of the recession, and working at The Gap, as you mentioned, and stocking DVDs while applying for every single design job that there was, it was the only way that I could keep going because of the fact that this is what I do. It's what I do when there's no one to pay me. It's what I do whenever I'm sick. It's what I do when I'm well. It's what I do, period. This is what I do. It's an outlet. And just like when I was a kid and I was doing this and my behavior changed, it's because I can keep myself in balance because it's an outlet. So it's more than just a profession, but it's one of those things that you have to practice and invest in so much in yourself, in hours, in practice, that 
you might not see any of the benefit. And yes, you're going to be investing a lot of money and time. You might not see that benefit, but until you fail and learn what you did wrong and try it again and fail and learn what you did wrong and try it again, if you don't build up that resilience, then you're not, you're, you won't be able to, to, to perform whenever it's actually time for you to perform. One last thing. When I did lose my job and I was for a year and nine months eating lunch in the park while falling asleep every night looking at typefaces and applying to every single job that there was on every single job board while I was going to my gap job, I would leave these people at these design jobs messages at one o'clock in the morning so that my message would be the first one that they got when they got to the office at nine o'clock in the morning so that when they called me back on my cell phone, I could then call them back on my break when I was folding sweaters at the gap. So be relentless, be relentless. The only way that you can move through this and invest in yourself and benefit from that time is if you're doing it. So all of that time that I was spending trying to freelance, folding those sweaters, when I did land my first job in advertising a year and nine months later, when it was time for me to become the head at that digital agency within um, within JWT, I used all my contracts from the time when I was broke. So if you quit, it'll never come back around. And if you quit, you'll never have what you're going to need whenever you're on top. You know, if you quit, then you'll never know what you would have been and you'll have these regrets. And so I have no regrets because I've used the time wisely and I've, I've done all that I could do so that even when I fail, I hold my head up because there was nothing else for me to do. So as long as you can move forward without any regrets, because you didn't go to the movies when you should have been studying or you didn't go to, you know, buy clothes when you should have been buying supplies. If you walk in and you open your portfolio and you're not embarrassed because that's what I said when I was at Hampton. When I opened my portfolio, I would not be embarrassed. And I made that, I said that one time, but I spent every day meaning it. And to this day, I mean it. So I work when I have time. I'll go to the movies later. I'll go shopping later. Right now, I will work and I'll ask you to do the same because it will pay off. Wow. Wow. Boy, you're giving me, you're encouraging me. <laughs> you're encouraging me. I'm grateful me. that you had me on, Linda. Thank wow. You. This is, this has been really great. Douglas, please tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you if you want, if they want you to come out to speak or to purchase your book or, or how they can um, take a, one of your online courses. Give your contact information. Absolutely. So if you want to get in contact with me, my email address is simply me, me at douglasdavis.com. My website is thinkhowtheythink.com or douglasdavis.com. That's where you can see Slay, a visual essay about successfully managing fear. You can email me on my website. If you're on Facebook and Twitter, you can reach me at CSBD book, and that's just the acronym for Creative Strategy in the Business of Design. That's at CSBD book, and uh, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, great. Now, and as always, I will definitely have all this information in the show notes. And and speaking of getting in contact, I would li- love for you all to please d- log on to www.wohwfactorbusinesspodcast. Com. And when you get there, you'll see a tab that says Get Connected. Go ahead and click on that and get connected. You can connect by way of Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and I'm also now on Spotify. So you can plug up and when you're driving in your car, working out and exercising, washing dishes or whatever, you can listen to um, the podcast and you won't miss out on anything such as our um, great guest that we had today. I want to thank you all for listening and you all have a blessed and wonderful week. Goodbye for now. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed this session, be sure to subscribe in iTunes and log on to wohwfactorbusinesspodcast.com for show notes, free resources, news, and more.